Well, moving from sustainability, we are moving into technology, which is all about reusing screens, right? Screens all around us, LED screens. And with that, I want to uh, invite up our first guest, which is Chris Burke. He heads up uh, Creative Technologies, who is a leading uh, AV supplier uh, and provider uh, uh, globally. He's the one's making all the noise next door because they did all the screens for Clock and Flap. Welcome, Chris. Our next one is Michael from, he's the Chief Operating Officer of Gusto Collective. They are a new brand tech agency, creative agency here in Hong Kong. And uh, our last and least, 30 years in Hong Kong, Beatrice, the head of Lore, which is a award-winning creative, which she's given me all things, designing and producing creative events and experiences for brands and destinations. So welcome. So technology, let's kick this thing off. We're gonna talk about AI, we're gonna talk about XR, MR, augmented reality, how we're using different technologies in the industry. And can you tell your guys to shut up for your session? Yeah, we're not doing the audio. We're only video over there, it's not us. <laughs> well, to kick that off, there's been so many transformations in, in technologies over the last few years. Um, we've come from a, a live experience into virtual uh, events for many years. We've been using the new virtual technologies that really connect into data. We look at ROI. The tools that they've given us are really amazing. So is hybrid here now to stay, or are we going to go back to the traditional way we've been doing live events? Maybe all quickly do a quick... I think it will be here to stay. I think it will, it will change what it looks like and how it feels. And, you know, remember six months ago, hybrid was still quite a key thing in the live events that we're seeing in, when we we're in Singapore and, and in Japan and Korea. And there's less of an onus. It's not as important as it was at the beginning of the P word when everyone went into, we have to do hybrid because that's the only way that we could communicate. Um, so I think it will stay. I hope it lifts in quality what people do with it and it become more creative because hybrid was there before, it was just called something else. And it was the kind of afterthought, it was the last thing that people thought about doing on a live event. So um, yeah, I think it'll stay. Michael? I totally agree with what Chris is saying and I think it's about how you actually um, incorporate technology in it, right? So. Hybrid in, the, so hybrid in the sense that um, you do a live event and we just have a camera on us taking the, taking the feed, put it back onto Zoom. I hope that is no longer going to be the standard. Um, so, I, so I would expect technology to feature much more um, in events itself as a way to augment, as a way to extend, right? So as a way to give people a way to taste what it's like to be in events uh, before you actually go into so a bit of a teaser. Um, a way to let you have a, a different level of, um, of interaction of, um, of immersion when you're actually in there. So for instance, if you're, if you're looking at us on screen, <clears throat> rather than just seeing us, you, like, you have a camera, that you have, you have an app that looks at us, you can actually see, how, uh, you can see uh, where else we're actually talking about, um, where we've been featured before, like, so, that, um, so that additional layer on, on, on top of it, but where this, this, the hybrid nature is not just another channel. Right? It's, actually, it's much, much more... Um, uh, fused in, in how technology is actually used. And from a broadcast perspective, we've been seeing augmented reality that's really <laughs> been implemented to different levels uh, recently, where, as an example, if you watch the fireworks show, I kept on asking them, how did they put LEDs on the CEC and light up everything you know, behind that show? And ultimately, it was augmented reality. So anyone watching on the videos or on broadcast saw this incredible what looked like LED show on CEC, was all augmented reality. And I think even in now in the big broadcasts and sports broadcasting, we're seeing these incredible, incredible content that enhances the show, uh, adds value to the people that are watching it and broadcast. In the audience, you can't see it because they'll probably have big screens, you can see it. So what's your experience with working? You've been, done, been doing quite a few projects here in AR as well in Hong Kong, um, even for the Kusama uh, M Plus exhibition, right? Yeah. So. Um so the the Kusama exhibition is is, um, is really interesting because it was a, it was a chance for us to use technology to extend the Kusama experience itself. So the mandate that we got from um, from the Kusama studio and also from M Plus was that uh, Kusama wanted her pumpkins not to be only accessible by those within the museum itself, but for people to be able to take these with them to be able to experience it. 
Um, so through, um, through creating uh, digital doubles of them where people can actually bring these pumpkins with them um, around Hong Kong, it's a way of, um, of making her art much, much more accessible. Um, I think really, I think like, to, like, to your other point, um, using, it, uh, using it for events and like in, uh, like, some, like some of the really interesting stuff that you, like, that you see is, is actually in sports. So like, so in the NBA, for instance, as, you, like, as, um, as, people, as, as players go up for layups or uh, for shoots, you can actually see the stats behind them. That kind of stuff is really cool. Um, I don't think we've seen as much of that in Hong Kong yet, but I would love to be able to work on things like that in the future. But I mean, it's also interesting on the augmented, like you did with Kusama, you're able to then connect it, take your selfie, put yourself within that picture, send it to social channels as well, right? So it's not only just using it for that value, but how can I broadcast it out? Yeah, so there's definitely, there's definitely an amplification value to this, right? Because look, I mean, let's be, let's be honest. I, I want to play with something cool, but it's not just for me. I want to tell everyone that I'm really cool because I, I was there. Um, so, it, so, it, so, it's useful, um, so it's useful for the artist to satisfy her philosophy, but it's also good for the, the events, um, the event host to help, to help them with amplification and getting more foot traffic. Beatrice. Me and Beatrice are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Same as Jasper. Jasper says the hybrid's dead. It's all live in person. I say no way. It's a combination. So what's your perspective? No, no. A hybrid is here to stay. There is no question about it. And I think Edward from Cathay Pacific mentioned mindful, uh, mindful flying. What we see these days is that conferences are asking us to bring corporate business events a third of the people because they are mindful of how many people are flying because of the... Uh, Ecology, so it will certainly uh, certainly come, and the audience that is not at the event can't as much as the audience coming. It's clear, but better. But better. You, but you also have to program separately for that, right? I mean, I think this is you can't just say, oh, great, we're going to have cameras here, put that, have a streaming audience. You really have to program for a virtual audience and what they get to experience, how they experience, as well as a live audience, correct? And, and the in niche need each their own MCs, they need their own programs, their own entertainment. They meet in the middle. There's a hybrid part, but they have their own program as well. Next word, AI. We've had an incredible uh, push on chat GPT and seeing how it's transforming industry, not just chat GPT, but AI taking over all of the processes, the manual processes that we've been working on, programs like Notion that bring all of your work workstations together. So. Have you guys had the, op where do you see AI fitting in? I've been using ChatGPT for all the marketing content, uh, session descriptions, ads, more, and all of these things. I think it's incredibly helpful. And we're just at the beginning of how we can use these tools to be way more efficient than we are currently. I don't see it affecting what we do. Um, at the end of the day, we need a human pushing buttons, being talked to by a human to call a show on whatever scale you put that to. So for us, uh, no impact. For content, yes, definitely an impact. Um, I know that some of the uh, film companies are using AI uh, to select content in their previs. So they don't have to go into a library and search for it. They'll just tap in keywords, and they have these enormous libraries of content where they can then cost each scene based on that. And it cuts the time to actually do that by 10, 20 times. But live events and AI for us and technology, nothing. But are, are you also not saying, well, from a live event, broadcast control is an example, doesn't need to be here. It can be in New York, I yeah. can be running exactly. a lot remote of these production. types of live events. Yeah, from, right? absolutely, yeah, remote production is a key thing, but, but there's, there's no AI influence on that. But it is definitely coming, and, and you know, in our, the studios that we have around the world, um, that our remote production studios have revolutionized the broadcast industry over the last two years where people couldn't travel. So where you would have in a conventional, uh, like an NFL game or an NBA game, you've got trucks outside in a broadcast compound, hundreds of people making it work. Now that can be cut down by two thirds where you just send the camera trucks and thousands of miles away and sometimes in another country, you have the directors, the producers, the engineers and with hardly any latency, we're talking milliseconds of latency going across fiber networks around the globe. And uh, that really has been a, a massive uh, advance in tech in the last two years. I think we were talking earlier too, there's a new technology, even using AI as how you're going to 
integrate brand integration. So we're seeing a lot of the sporting events, the AI technologies can read the, 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 the what's happening in the whole video, and I can input brands. I can, you know, here sitting, we could have a table with uh, Heineken next to us, and it's all being done uh, in the cloud. Uh, now passing things up very fast, and, and the AI is really the product in, product integration. Is re and you're seeing in sports games too, all the brands showing up on the turf. Well, that's not there when you're watching it. That's really being put in, right? So, Michael, your perspective, AI, and where's this going to fit into live events? It's um, so I agree with Chris that definitely on the production on the content production side, it makes a huge difference, and not only for events but any kind of content cr production that you do, right? So. Um, I mean, I, I think you also hit it like on like the nail on the head by calling this a tool. It is, it is a tool. And at the end of the day, you still need someone to drive it. So the, the value of a tool is that it takes out the really repetitious manual labor so you can focus on the higher value added stuff, right? So one place that we've been using it a lot on um, is for, a bit, for really early concepts, like really early, early ideation. So instead of having to get my creative directors or, um, or, like, or the team to work on really, really early stage um, mock-ups, even I can go into mid-journey, type by typing something, and I and I have an and I have a rendition, um, or something that I can actually go talk to clients about in the, in a matter of minutes. Um, so, look, I mean, the, like usage for uh, usage for tools is not new, right? Like, autopilot is a tool, like not autopilot on a Tesla, but autopilot on a, on, a, on a plane. Before you had that, you need an, you needed a, additional cockpit crew in there to be able to fly long distances. Now you need like, now. You know, it, it repositions the, like it repositions the um, the operator more as a systems person and more as a creative person rather than having to literally do really really manual work. Um, for another a bit of work that um, that we do a lot on, um, like such as metahumans, it's it, it's a it's a huge improvement um, by automating um, again a lot of the really manual process in terms of how we do rigging, um, in terms of how we do uh, model fitting. Um, so it's. So can, can we back up one second? Sure. You said metahumans. Yep. So let's just exactly what that is. They've created a character that we don't have to be sitting here technically. It almost looks photorealistic. Uh, and they're able to use these almost like influencers, creating content around that, how they're starting to build that out. So they've built their own, and they use it for Mirror Across Town and, and, and Art Basel, I think, other projects like that. So the metahuman is really how we're using these animated characters that look human in speeches, interactions, uh, holograms that can stay. So now continue on with the metahuman dis. All right. So um, I think there's always a question about where, like, where you use a metahuman, right? And um, and what and what's a UK use case, like, especially for events. Um, so I think there, like, increasingly you're seeing them show, you're seeing them show up in like in actual production themselves. Um, so HSBC, for instance. Um, quite famous for having um, doing their um, their dual verse concert where where you, where you have a digital double. Um, in the case of um, of uh, Gem and um, and Mufa or May, or, May, or Mayday, they had they had con they had concerts on both sides of the strait, but the, but each person um, so the concert goers on, on each side will see one set of physical people um, and one and one and one set of avatars or, or one or one set of metahumans representing the, the performers on like on the other side. So, from um, from connectivity, from making this thing scalable, Alba is a great example of it, right? Um, there's a like, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of potential usage there. Now, for more utilitarian um, or more um, more functional usage, I think there's a lot of opportunity to use metahumans for service. Like but particular, particularly for hospitality, where 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 the interaction is a little more, is more complex than what than what we would expect if we were to just go up to a kiosk and and tap 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 to look for to look for a restaurant, um, but not so complex and not so sensitive in the nature of what we're talking about, like banking um, or or personal finances that we are not comfortable talking talking in um, in public. But I mean, as um, as you saw in the panel earlier. Events events can be pretty tough to try and use use this for like for that example because it's loud, right? You can be talking to the screen and the screen's talking to you. You cannot hear a single thing. You'll be much happier just click 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 like the, like one of those McDonald's kiosks. Click click click. Let me let, like, let me get get on with my life. So um, there's a lot of use cases for it. It's but it's not for everything. But can't we use it for like you know how many emails did we get on this event? You know, or I have a question. All these questions that people might have. Is isn't this a great tool? 
for how we answer the questions and, and build that around uh, particularly live events? You can use, you don't need a meta human to do that, to be, to be brutally Correct. honest, right? So, like, so you, need, um, you need NLP, um, you need some, like, and the, like, so the meta human is just one way of being able to act for a, um, a machine learning um, algorithm to be able to respond to you. Um, it can be responding to you through a, ch uh, through a chatbot. It could be responding to you through emails. It could be responding to you through a metahuman. These are just different formats. Beatrice. So, I, uh, okay, I from an event agency perspective now. Okay, from a uh, Cvent, who is still the, the leader in uh, event tech, just declined a 3.9 billion US dollar deal yesterday from BlackRock uh, because they believe that what they got uh, is enough and will sell higher. And they are the ultimate process simplification. And I'm sure it's because AI is behind. I think it will be more uh, critical as well for process to attract young people uh, to our industry, so we are less paperwork. So I think that will be important. However, AI is not only about how we run events and we manage them. Uh, facial recognition, difficult will not happen anytime soon for accessing uh, entrances. Uh, NERF as an AI, um, AI technology that allow you to transform a 2D or even a U with a 3D uh, by taking a camera and looking around you, creating a 3D version of you has been used recently for an automobile event where we go into hyper personalization, which means that I can say that I like Hawaii, like the shirt of Chris, and <laughs> That's about as red as my face now. <laughs> I can have a luggage client and I can have a 3D screen experience for taking a photo with a car that is in Hawaii because I choose Hawaii. And one thing is that uh, we've been doing an event for a jewelry uh, customer uh, where we had to integrate mixed reality. So mixed reality being that you have a device but you can still see the reality, the physical environment and the user of the Google will have to, uh, with all the technology, haptic and so on, the, will have to actually uh, look at the reality and, and, and have a virtual experience through it, uh, discovering the history of the brand and so on. And what was interesting is that actually with this, uh, with this uh, partner, what we were doing is that we didn't finish the design of the set so when they were looking with the Google, the set was finishing in a virtual world. So I think there is a lot of integration that will come that will be super, uh, super exciting. But do you think from XR, let's, as we move to, to extended reality, which is basically just building out the LED screens, instead of doing a green screen uh, type of an event, you have LEDs bottom, top, all surrounding you. Um, where is the state of XR uh, in this? Or is it just for broad broadcast now, or where do you see things happening? You had an XR stage as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I, it, there's a crossover, definitely, between the different uh, kind of markets. Certainly, obviously, film, TV, using LED volumes um, on the larger productions, and also car compositions, where traditionally a car would be just in a, a green screen environment, and then they would, in post-production, put the content in, but now it's in an LED volume. And they're quite small, they don't have to be huge. Um, I think when you start moving into live events, um, it's difficult, it's difficult. You've been on those LED volumes, the content is expensive to do, to do it correctly. Um, the production time needed on it is, is quite extensive. You can't just walk onto it and, as a performer or a speaker and just perform. It takes a lot of skill to, to do it properly. Um, so I don't think in live events, I think it was a bit of a fad during the last two years because, again, it was another opportunity to communicate which wasn't on Zoom. It was an improved solution, an improved way to do it, and people, you know, people bought it. They wanted to try it. Um, but now I think now we're back to live. We're certainly seeing all of that you know, just diminish very quickly. It's expensive. Uh, it's exp it's it is expensive. There's a lot of technology that goes into it. it a lot of technology that goes into but doing that. Don't you think that in the big events, like he showed Rise Conference, these other ones, it's massive screens all around you, whether it's behind you, on side you, everywhere. Isn't, isn't that still the idea, that content? Maybe that content just has to be repurposed in different ways. But don't, don't forget, on an LED volume or, or an, uh, an XR studio or a uh, mixed reality, the main audience is at the other end of the camera. 
it's not a live environment. You know, if we were sat on an LED volume here, anyone watching it on TV, it would look great. But for the folks sitting here, it would look strange because the camera frustrum would look odd on the screen behind us. So, so it's, it's not a live tool for a live audience, in my opinion. It's a tool for a remote audience or recorded content. And the other area where it is being used um, is in advertising. Advertising are using it for you know, creating environments. You, know, you have an LED volume for a day, and then every hour you have a different environment. And it's turned around quickly. But content is the key, absolutely. So I think an interesting part of some of these things, it's, it's not necessarily talking about how do we use technology, it's understanding the strategy, the, the use purpose that we're trying to accomplish with this. Usually in events, the digital stuff was always out of budgets because we had to pay for all of you know, creative technologies equipment, so we didn't have enough for the interesting ones, but now we're seeing that these projects can be built into marketing budgets, into other types of areas, so we can amortize costs about that. And I think it's just using the right tool, right? Like, you, you know, an entertainment film, you did Warriors of the Future, right? And you used NFTs to help market, promote, and build that. So maybe give us a little brief about how, to, how you used NFTs to bring the community connected to that film and the content. Sure, so uh, Warriors of the Future was a 2022 uh, Hong Kong summer blockbuster by Louis Koo. Um, and we were engaged with him late 2021, early 2022, about um, developing a Web3 activation engagement uh, program for, uh, for this movie, making it the first time that a, a, um, a major film in Asia has actually tried to go to market like this. Um, so we, we came to an early understanding that, um, that the, the focus is, isn't actually on the movie itself, right? Um, at least not on this, like, this specific movie. So. Um, the movie is, a, is styled a little bit like one of the Marvel movies, so it's an, it's an action film, um, very, very clearly set up for prequels, sequels, etc. Et um, so rather than making this, fo so that was, a, that was an important part, um, moment for us because understanding that the focus, that whatever we're doing needs to have legs to it um, to make sure that the engagement can actually last until the, the next series come out, um, and, in, and in their case also making, um, also giving the studio the ability to monetize this at the studio level. So also, so also promoting one cool, uh, like one cool as a, as a um, uh, movie um, producer. Um, so at the very, very core of what we were doing um, was, um, was creating a metaverse environment, a little bit like a universal studio for them. That would be a place where their, where their fans um, and the viewers, their followers, like, like, so whoever these interested parties are can come together to be able to um, to experience things about the film that you normally can't access, right? So behind the scenes, um, behind the scenes clips, um, be able to um, to come together and co-create certain parts of of, um, of future films. Uh, be able to whether it's the plot, whether it's um, whether it's music, etc., um, and be rewarded for your uh, be rewarded for your contribution. Um, and as a and as with most uh, most metaverse projects, of course, there is an NFT element to it, right? Where the NFT serves multiple purposes, so it is a, it's a token um, that represents your identity, represents your engagement, represents your loyalty. But it's also a way for a, a, for the the project to then be able to airdrop or um, or or give you access to rewards. That's all in the Web3 space. Um, now, in reality, the Web3 community, no matter how um, how vocal and how um, how engaged they are, they are still a very, very small portion of the entire world. So we also came out with a, um, with a Web 2.5 um, alternative to this where, um, where th those NFTs also have usage outside of, the, uh, um, outside of that metaverse environment. Um, so as part of the, the um, go-to-market uh, package, we also developed um, a series of mobile games for them themed after the movie where the NFT becomes something that you, that you can use within the game to, unlocks, um, to unlock different functions, unlock different um, gameplay, right? Um, the NFT also gives you access to, to physical toys, to, um, to backstage events, to, being able to, to, to go see uh, prequels, um, go, uh, go meet the stars. So again, so, ex so extending this outside of the, the traditional um, Web3 um, web space there. So really about co-creation with the community as well, right? And, and even things that they were co-creating within that would show up in the, in the next film as well. Yeah, so look, I mean, I think the, 
the focus for us is yes, we yes we used a lot of Web3 technology in this, right? But that's not but that's not the point. Um, so we as a brand tech company, I am technology agnostic, right? I, I know how to use technology for storytelling, for creating immersive experiences. But what I use is, but I don't go out and, and actively advertise, like, hey, I'm going to do something really cool for you because it's Web3. Web3 is just a means to an end. Um, the same thing for any of the technology that I use. So I'll use whatever makes sense, um, but it has to be used in a way that's, um, that drives business value, um, that drives um, user value. And also, like it, it, it cannot be a means to an end. Like you, you cannot focus. You cannot. Keep, you cannot keep harping on it. Um, and it, and also, like it cannot. It cannot then become a distraction for people, right? So, um, so rather, so rather, so rather than the harping, harping on on um, on Web three and focusing on one very small subset of the addressable audience, using the, like you making, adapting this in a way that even normal people like my mom um, or my wife who. Um, who may want to go watch a movie, who may have an interest in the movie, can still access this. It's seamless. The process becomes seamless. There is a lot of uh, experimentation. I think some uh, brand likes to be attached to the value of innovation and experimentation. And that is cool, because we're as well learning you know, through the pop-ups. You know, how do we give people an experience through the metaverse? And we did a B2B, uh, B2B um, uh, hybrid uh, events. Uh, SIS, where we actually stream onto the metaverse, metaverse blockchain and metaverse uh, virtual, Decaland, the Decentraland uh, part of the conference. And that's where you need to experiment because the bankers don't necessarily have the graphic card on their computers to watch it. And, and there is a lot about, you know, being on a journey with your clients and, and, and developing with them and trying out. Chris, from, from your perspective, what excites you? What technology do you see right around the corner that you want to grab a hold of? How long have I got? Right, so it's, you know, I could go on for hours with this. I mean, look, I think a big part of our business is, is display, right? So it's what you see, whether you're at Clock and Flap or you're at an event like this, and, you know, high quality, high resolution display, whether it's projection, whether it's LED, you know, the pixel pitches are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It does. It also kind of is complemented by people's expectations are higher now because you've got 4K TVs at home, um, 4K broadcasting. Well, in an, in an event environment where you have high quality content, then high, high tech and high quality display is what you want. Well, whatever it is, projection or LED or screens, whatever. Um, what's exciting is to us is what's behind that because managing that level of data and content uh, it's getting tougher and tougher just because there's, it's, it's so huge, right? The, the gigabytes and terabytes sometimes of data that you've got to push onto these screens is, um, is tough. So that's exciting in that market. There's some pretty exciting audio stuff coming out now where um, really programmable audio. So you have a stack of speakers you know, that could hang on this truss here and you could pinpoint certain sounds to certain locations. It's really, really funky stuff that you would never think you'd be able to do. And it brings basically 3D immersive sound from one position, which is, you know, it's, it, you would think it's impossible to do. Um, I so mean, you yeah. created fantastical worlds, right? With projection mapping and yeah. lighting up spaces yeah. and LEDs. You, I mean, it was interesting several years, I can't say the word, several years ago when we were really building out projection mapping yep. and the experiences, we were creating the metaverse in the real world, I think. Yeah. And it's interesting how we will connect both of those now, you know, and say, hey, look, it's not just going to be at this one location for three hours, but how do we extend that into a possible metaverse solution? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And those immersive environments now, I mean, you see it everywhere. You see what Moment Factory are doing and you see these immersive Van Gogh exhibitions where it's not just about the art, it's the story behind the art and then you bring all the different techniques and tools to, to make that uh, a, a crazy experience. So yeah, that's exciting, really exciting. I, I, I really think that's where Hong Kong will have a, place, uh, a, a space to play because we have such a strong, unique culture and there is such a need for unique content that I really think that the people in the room here, room, space, uh, and, and the people have a lot to offer, so we create something exciting. And what excites me is to see that children that use teal brush and can go under their own design and behind their design, I cannot see the next generation of architects coming 
uh, and creators. So that's, that's really exciting me. Well, I hope we, uh, you know, just topped on a lot of these issues happening now. Things are happening really fast. And, and the most important advice that we can say is jump in. Start working in these, in these different areas and testing it and playing it because, you know, in 12 months things change, like compared to several years previously. So find the right partners, you know, find the local companies that are doing the cool projects as well and call them up and say, hey, what do we have? You know, because collectively, I think until you start working in it, that's the one thing. You, it just, you can read about it, but until you see it, you touch it, you feel it, that's really when things change. So, uh, well, thank you all for uh, joining us. We're out of time, and uh, we'll we see say, you in the metaverse. Can, can we say